I don't know if you're familiar with the psoas muscle. There's a magical muscle deep inside the body. To me, the most important muscle in the body It's a major pain muscle. And the way we stand, the way we hold our pelvis doesn't allow the psoas to work well or live in good alignment. And I feel most people's head and neck issues are really, they're from, they're coming from the pelvis and the psoas more than the head and the neck. That if you real, if you fix your posture and realign your pelvis, you would get more range of motion in the head and the neck, which might seem counterintuitive. Are you curious about discovering ways of making your life better? Then welcome to my podcast. I'm Bob Nickman, and this is The Exploding Human. Listen in while I talk with all kinds of people in the fields of personal growth, health and healing, alternative therapies, psychology, spirituality, environment, and the future. I'm looking for those answers that make life better for everyone. You'll meet cutting-edge practitioners, doctors, artists, filmmakers, business people, and those who have overcome challenges. The brave, the curious, anyone who's out there helping us humans to explore, expand, and explode. Hey, welcome to The Exploding Human. My name is Bob Nickman. My guest today is Jonathan Fitzgordon. And we're going to be talking about such things as back pain, leg pain, and the method he developed to change the body's habitual movement patterns through awareness and repetition. First, I'd like to invite you to visit my website, theexplodinghuman.com. Over there, you can listen to episodes, read synopses, see photos of my guests. There's also a YouTube channel where you can listen. That is The Exploding Human with Bob Nickman. As I said, my guest today is Jonathan Fitzgordon. He has created something called the Rejuvenation Movement Method, born out of his own situation where he had to have multiple knee surgeries and he kept injuring himself and he realized that there was something going on with his body that was creating this problem. So he began to study a variety of techniques, which we're going to talk about, and how he synthesized what he learned and how he helps other people to overcome back pain and other issues they might have with how their body moves and responds. So let's get right into it. This is Jonathan Fitzgordon. Jonathan, I'm happy you're here, man. You're living in my hometown of Cleveland, and we just had a nice rap about the pluses of Ohio, northern Ohio. And uh, I guess that's considered northern Ohio. It's not like Toledo, but it's northeast, yeah. We used to joke about Cleveland being the mistake on the lake. That was the, that mm-hmm. was the, that's what they called it. But I, you know, I don't have that feeling about it anymore. I thought it was a really uh, great place to grow up as we talked about, but that's not why we're here. That's not why, but you know, it's a little pre, a little pre talk because but we were talking and I'll watch this segue. Here it comes. We were talking about pre having uh, injuries before surgery. See how I did that. Yeah, very well, very well. The pre thing there, I, I didn't know that was going to happen. <laughs> and I'm talking way too much. Okay, so we're going to talk about rejuvenating the body, how you've come up with with a method. I know you've had three knee surgeries uh, prior to uh, discovering these things for yourself. Tell us the story. You know, let's get going on your story. Uh, enough about me. I'm too into myself, and I'm kind of getting tired of myself. Okay, go ahead. Thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah. I started doing yoga in uh, New York City, which is where we were before we came to Cleveland, in 1995. So I was uh, a little over 30. I was an active guy. I rollerbladed a lot. I was a carpenter. I wasn't, I was in good shape, but I got to yoga and I fell in love immediately. I started doing it six days a week in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And I was really good at it. You know, I was born to do yoga. I didn't know it at the time, but my joints of that, well, I didn't know it because I grew up putting my feet behind my head and doing lotus with my brother and we would wrestle in lotus position. And wow. so I had this ability and I got to yoga and I was just good because I could, you know, do so many kooky things with my joints. But about two years later, my knees started to ache pretty bad. Mm. And the people who I was learning from weren't, on about teaching alignment. They didn't really teach you how to do it. They just said, you know, do it as far and deeply as you could. And I went too far and my injuries weren't necessarily, they were set up by yoga, but I was playing softball and I 
planted and twisted unsuccessfully, which is a pretty classic meniscus tear. You plant your foot. When you pivot, your knee is supposed to pivot, and it doesn't, and the rest of the body does. But that was a pretty severe surgery. That was like I lost the, the whole mooring. The meniscus came off of the bone itself. So Ooh, they, ouch, they, ouch, they, ouch. Yeah. Yeah, they sewed that back on, and that was a pretty intense recovery. The other two surgeries were uh, clean outs of meniscus. So it was two on one leg, one on the other. And I kept doing physical therapy to the doctor, the surgery, the physical therapy. And after the third series, I was back in yoga and one of my teachers looked at me and she said, so why aren't you going to have a fourth surgery? And I, that was just this amazing moment for me. I never thought I was, you know, that stupid. But I realized in that moment that I was doing the exact same thing over and over again. And if I didn't change the way I did my yoga and lived my life, I was going to be back in the surgeon's office for a fourth time. That was the, really the, the start of taking a step back and learning how my body worked. And it started with walking, standing. You know, I teach people how to stand, how to walk, how to exercise correctly. And no one knows how to walk. And standing is even harder to teach than walking. So I sort of do that through the process of movement. Yeah, it all grew out of that. I was my own first client. Changing the way I stood and walked went a long way to getting rid of my injuries. Well, it's so interesting you would say that because, you know, we just assume that, uh, you know, you're born and you're a human being and you, you know how to crawl, you know how to walk. And if you watch little kids, they kind of do. But I don't know. It's sort of almost like we unlearn it in some way for a variety of reasons. But then I took some classes uh, in uh, the Alexander Technique many years mm -hmm. ago. And the woman that was teaching me goes, well, you're not standing correctly. Go, what do you mean? I'm standing up. She goes, well, your knees are locked, for one. They're not supposed to be. I said, but I'll be shorter if I unlock my knees. She goes, no, you won't. <laughs> and we stood in front of a mirror. And she goes, unlock your knees. And let's, you know, she kind of aligned my back. And I was actually taller. So I actually had a belief that that made me taller. And being a short guy, I guess that might have been part of an insecurity to want to be a little bit taller. I mean, I don't know how much it was. I thought it was going to gain me or what it was going to gain me. But that was an interesting thing. Like, and and even, you know, in that technique, they they talk about, and it was started by a guy who was, a, I think he was a vocalist and he was wondering why his voice kept going out and why he couldn't sing. And I remember getting sort of, position and aligned and my voice getting louder and more resonant. So is this the kind of thing you, you studied or what did you study? And what is your, you know, I'm fascinated by people that do this kind of stuff because it's very subtle to a civilian like myself. No, that's great stuff. I, I have taken the Alexander technique. I have not studied it like, um, you know, in a school I have, I'm really interested in rolfing, which is myofascial work. Again, I've been Rolfed many times. I've never studied it in school. I've studied with a lot of different teachers, but I'm really self-taught. I love Alexander technique. And like you said, it's very subtle. I love Feldenkrais, another body movement technique, also very subtle. I, I, I can run off a, a, a whole host of things that I really love. Body mind centering is a woman body vein with Cohen, more subtle than Alexander and Feldenkrais. So when I decided to teach people to walk, one of the things that I wanted to do was make all of these very subtle practices as simple as I could. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm self-taught and I am applying what I have learned from all of these different practices, but trying to make it as absolutely as simple as possible. And the subtlety of Alexander works for a lot of people. Like it's great stuff, but uh, simple also works really well. So I just developed a, a simple bunch of phrases like stick your butt out and lean forward to do the sort of the similar thing. You know, I, I love folks that kind of figure something out for them. I, I have a lot of people on this show. They figured out stuff for themselves and then it becomes their passion and then it becomes a career or at least something they can pass on to other people. And it sounds like that's exactly what you did. And the idea that we can do that and heal ourselves by just by paying attention and learning some very, like you say, simple things 
is very inspiring to me that that people can do that. I I feel like I uh, am a little bit on the lazy side or when it comes to, you know, becoming somebody like that, but also I think desperation is a big part of a lot of this stuff. You know, it sounds like you were absolutely in a play and maybe I'm wrong that you were desperate to go, what am I going to do? How am I going to not be the guy that has to have surgeries all these times again and again? Well, pain is a great incentive. There is no question about it. You know, no one stands well, no one walks well, but it doesn't matter if you're not in pain because there's no particular reason or drive to change, make changes like that you should, but pain is a really a great incentive. You also mentioned something interesting, which is locking your knees. And that's my story that I locked my knees and that's what led to my uh, meniscus going south. And a lot of people I work with are hypermobile and locking the knees is one of the like hallmarks of hypermobility. And a lot of people who are hypermobile don't know they're hypermobile. And the name of my private program is Be Your Own Healer. And that's, I work over Zoom and it's really like, I don't fix people. I just guide people to fix themselves. Because like you said, the best, the best approach is to figure out how to heal yourself. And it's very possible for, there are plenty of issues and diseases and autoimmune things and that we can't just fix ourselves, but there are just as many uh, things that we can fix ourselves. When you say hypermobile, what does that mean exactly? I mean, I know I, I know what hyper means and I know what mobile means, but when you put it together, you know, like I was locking my knees. I, I never considered myself somebody that was in, uh, hyper means more, like very mobile, right? Or am I? Yeah. So hypermobility, hyper, like hyper extending your knees is taking your knees back past their normal range of motion. Okay. All right. And to do that, you have to have somewhat loose joints to be able to do that. And then classically, like I hyper extend my knees like crazy, but I can't hyper extend my elbow. But a lot of people can. That's another, like, if you take the test for hypermobility, locking the knees are a point each knee, locking the elbows are a point each knee, too easy looseness in the fingers and like touching the thumb to the forearm. And oh. they're just putting uh, bending forward and putting your hands flat on the floor. There are all these weird signs of hypermobility that, you know, when I got to yoga, everyone was like, this is so great. You could do all these things. And it was my hype. It was my ability to do certain things that really led to the surgeries. And another weird thing about hypermobility is you can be really tight and hypermobile at the same oh. time. Okay. So that's, that's an interesting thing because you'd think it would be the exact opposite, but it's, it, so you have this, basically you're genetically predis, predisposed to being hyper mobile. It sounds like a genetic gift or liability, depending on how you use it, but then you can still be tight if you're not using the, the, the muscles. So it's a, it is definitely a blessing and a curse. And I take it as a blessing now, since I've built a lot of muscle around my loose joints. I would say it is genetic. Everyone in my family is hypermobile. And the, the thing about the body, you know, the body is designed to survive and to adapt and to heal. So for me, I'm of, of the loose hypermobile type. There's not a loose muscle in my body, which serves really well for yoga. But for a lot of people, you're hypermobile in your knees and your hips and your, your spine and muscles that surround those joints tighten up it compensates for the joint. So a lot of people who are hypermobile have very tight hamstrings, very tight hips, and that's really compensatory as much as anything else. Look what I just learned. That's fantastic. Yeah, I've been doing, I started doing yoga. I did it like 30 some years ago and then I stopped and I don't even remember why. I liked it and then I stopped, yeah. I, you know, whatever. I started again about a year ago. I still can't get my hands to go flat on the floor. I don't care that I can't, but uh, I guess I should feel good about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's so correct. It's really great. It's a great way of looking at it. What I, one of the interesting things I do talking about tightness, like we do a lot of things. I still am a yoga teacher and love teaching yoga. It's fine to be tight. It's fine to be loose. It's actually really good to be equally tight and loose on, on both sides. And a lot of the things I'm dealing with and the people I'm helping are super tight on one side and not the other. 
And that's really where we get into more trouble. So to be equally tight, it really isn't the worst thing. Well, I always wonder about, you know, the body skeleton and the muscles and one side is always different than the other side. And I, I always am wondering what, you know, obviously if you're right-handed, you're more prone to using that side of your body for certain things, which I'm right-handed, but I'm tighter on the right side of my body than on my left. Even if I move my head from left to right, it gets tight on my neck when I turn to the right my right hip flexor has a tightness and a little bit more pain's not the right word, but you know, when I move it, it's not as, it's not as uh, flexible and it hurts a little bit. And until I started doing yoga, it was hurting to just put my pants on. Now it doesn't. Wow. I'm just using my own body. I, and I noticed that and my back is tighter on the right side. So my whole right side, which I probably favor in some ways, cause I'm right-handed this is what I'm thinking. I don't know anything, but you know, we're not aligned perfectly, but are you saying that some of what you're doing would uh, mitigate that with some work? Yes. That's great stuff. A bunch to unpack. So we're handed. So we're all dominant on one side. So, but you can be dominant arm and uh, uh, the opposite leg dominant, which is a really interesting thing, but we tend to be stronger on one side, which means those muscles are going to be tighter. Like you say, you're right-handed, I'm left-handed. I, you know, do all sorts of different exercises. There's no question that I'm stronger on my left side. But then the other thing you mentioned, which is really classic, is most people tend to get injured on one side of the body. And that is what I'm trying to help people with, right? You tend to get the right hip flexor, and it could be the right shoulder, it could be the right ankle. But most people tend to be injured and suffer on one side of the body. Yeah. Car accidents and like falls and different kind of injuries could mitigate that, right? Where you can break a right wrist and a left ankle and that can start messing you up. But when it comes to posture, posture is really interesting stuff. And a lot of it's perception. Like you did not perceive that you locked your knees. You just did it. And I'm pointing out to people that basically you perceive yourself incorrectly in space i think everyone leans backwards and kind of leans their thighs forward so what's interesting about that is that i'm always trying to help people on one side almost always like the right side or the left side but i start just standing up straight and trying to fix their alignment front to back that i feel like you have to get people to really stack their bones and get their upper body on top of their lower body before you can start addressing your right side issues. And for you, we would automatically start with the pelvis. I, I start everyone with the pelvis. I don't know if you're familiar with the psoas muscle. There's a magical muscle deep inside the body. To me, the most important muscle in the body is the major pain muscle. And the way we stand, the way we hold our pelvis doesn't allow the psoas to work well or live in good alignment. And I feel most people's head and neck issues are really, they're from, they're coming from the pelvis and the psoas more than the head and the neck. That if you real if you fix your posture and realign your pelvis, you would get more range of motion in the head and the neck, which might seem counterintuitive, but that, you know, that's what, that's what I'm applying over and over and over again. So here's one of the things that I find, uh, difficult in changing. And I know, you know, I've changed a lot of stuff over a lot of years. That's one of the reasons I do this podcast is I want to share some of the things I've done and meet people that are doing that kind of thing. But I find that change is really difficult in terms of, mostly in terms of the mind that like, unless you're actually having some experience, usually a physical experience, a repetitive, that you can't think your way into changing. But how do you get people to, you know, make this, these changes, a, you know, an integral part of, of their life so they don't just go, oh, that was great. That hour I just spent with Jonathan was amazing. And now I've forgotten everything and I'm going to the store and I'm walking around and I'm at work and I'm, and I'm, you know, here I am three days later and it's all gone. How do you help people to integrate what you're teaching? Well, it's great because you're sort of answering your questions with the, when you ask them. So it's neuromuscular repatterning through repetition. That's what I, one of the ways I look at what I do. And it's all about repetition, like you said. So 
where I used to do one-off privates and stuff, I, I now have a private program where it's three months to a year because it really does take yeah. a good while to make these changes. Changing standing is even harder than changing walking. Both of those things are things we're not designed to think about. No, right? Like breathing, does, you're not thinking about it. That's exactly right. But the minute I change your posture, I change your breathing as well. Like it's all these unconscious behaviors that we don't want to think about. But if you can, it's going to help you a ton. Again, pain is a great incentive. But yeah. I, you know, I meet a lot of people who aren't in pain, but they want to age better. Or they're, you know, I'm 60 and you start to realize, oh, okay, you know, it's not as fluid as it once was. And <laughs> so making those changes can be super helpful, but it's a little odd, right? But certain people have it, find this work easier. Sure. Like the more compulsive you are, like, you know, not to say anything, there's anything good about OCD, but, you know, people who are obsessive and compulsive, they make the changes that I'm asking them to make so quick. It's incredible. That, like, if I split up my clients, I can say half of them, I'm telling them, slow down, right? Like, they dive into it and they obsess on it and they pay so much attention and they get great results immediately. But I'm also like, you got to take it slow because it's, it's change and change really does take a long time. It's no simple thing. But then uh, the other half of my clients, I have to reach out to repeatedly make an appointment, make an appointment. And then we get on, you know, are you doing the work? Be your own healer means you have to do the work. There are different reasons why some people can and can't do the work. And we work through that, but the variety of personality types that can or can't make the changes we're talking about is fascinating. Yeah, we're all interesting creatures that way. You know, I'd probably be the more on the compulsive side if I, when I do stuff, if I like it, I can't stop. But then, you know, the thing is about quick results, you have a tendency to get a little lazy later and kind of go, well, I was, I'll just get it back next week because I lost, I forgot about it and I lost it. Or you're just, it, it doesn't integrate as permanently when it's too fast. That's what I find. If I, if I get some, if I do something too quick, it doesn't set like, exactly like right. other things. Yeah. Is it hard when you like, let's say you go to the, I want to pick a mall. You go to the mall and you just see all these people walking and they look like they look, you know, I could help that her. I could help her. That guy's like, oh man, his knee is all messed up. And now all he's got to do is this. Do you ever just like walk up to people and go, I could help you? <laughs> it must be sort of hard to see it, you know, some sometimes, or you just have to, I don't know, you're smiling. So I'm assuming you have had that experience. <laughs> I don't walk up to strangers. I look at strangers constantly. I drive my family crazy. Like my kids are just like, stop looking. Cause I will just comment and go, oh, that person's in trouble. And that person's not going to do well. I have found over the year, what I do is really kind of odd. You have to have buy-in. And I have found over the years, working with friends is not necessarily the best approach for me because they don't always take it seriously. <laughs> but like my son plays hockey, my daughter plays roller derby. And those are the moments where like we're walking out of the rink and I just notice somebody is limping or doing something really odd. And then I will say, you know, this is what I do. And if you'd like to get together, I'm mm -hmm. really happy to give you some tips, but I don't try to solicit business that way, just historically. And it's, what's really interesting about what I do is it's, a lot of people like they'll join my program and they'll really love it and they'll get benefits like pretty quickly. And even it'll say over three months and then they want to recommend it to other people, which I am all for, right? That's how we have a business and, and continue and thrive in our business. But I have learned that a, a simple referral is rarely enough that the buy-in has to come from kind of deep within. And I'll tell people like, yeah, I'll, I'm happy to meet with somebody, but maybe send them to my podcast, send them to my website, let them check out my stuff, watch some of my videos to see if they're actually interested. I find most of the people I end up working with have been following me for honestly, sometimes a number of years, Yeah, not yeah. you know more than that before they make the leap to a private program, which is a big, can be a big leap. 
Yeah, it does take time. That's I think that's why you get bombarded with emails from companies. People realize that I've got to remind this person. There's a great Walt Whitman quote from the 1800s, which is, uh, the public is a thick-skinned beast whose hide must be constantly beaten to remind them that you're there. <laughs> uh, great. <laughs> it's great. You know, sometimes when I'm teaching, I feel like I'm just repeating myself, and I'll say, like, I'll apologize or say, and people are like, oh, no, just like... Keep saying it over and over again. Not that many poses that I'm teaching in the course of classes, you know, but you just keep doing the same ones over and over again. They resonate and um, repetition really works. It does. And I, I'm glad you brought up uh, rolfing because I've done that. I have a guy that I've gone to over the years. It's been a long time now, but I have a, I'll just use my own body as an example. I have a, my right foot kind of turns out and it's coming from my knee somewhere and probably my pelvis. And I walk, it's not super, I mean, it's obvious, but it isn't like, you know, that guy's messed up. You just think he's got an odd gait is really what it kind of looks like. And I was walking with another friend of mine and his brother, who's a podiatrist, was behind us. He goes, you always walk that way? <laughs> like, he, <laughs> I go, yeah. You know, and I've had rolfing and I've had, had them work on stuff and it doesn't hold because, you know, I'm not doing anything after that. It feels great when he's doing it, you know, and working on the bottom of the feet and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it's it's an amazing feeling to go through a number of those sessions, by the way. I'm sure you've done it. So, you know, can I change that? I don't really know. I don't, it's like you say, I'm not in pain, so I don't think about it that much. I just know people are probably laughing at me. Well, no, I mean, watch people walk down the street. Many people walk with both feet turned out. Many people walk with one foot turned out. Uh, the, the foot turnout is from your psoas muscle, actually not from the knee, but from oh, the, okay. the tight psoas pulls. It's the psoas that makes your whole right side tight. And the way a tight psoas manifests is it turns one of the feet out, and that foot probably has a higher arch as well. That's another like part of the psoas, tightness. Mm -hmm. Can you fix that? Yeah. Fix is not the exact word. Yeah. It's uh, like yeah. improve. You can, you want to improve it, right? Which doesn't mean the foot is ever going to turn in. But when the foot turns out, you use that foot in a particular way. You probably wear your shoes out on the outside of that. Yeah. Shoe. Mm -hmm. And so you want to change the pelvis. It's not just turning the feet in. You have to learn to walk by changing the position of your pelvis. And all of a sudden, you would start walking more to the inside of the foot than the outside of the foot. The foot would, it might turn in a, a tiny bit, right? It's not like you have to make that foot the same as the other foot, but even that tiny bit of turn in that happens naturally from the hips is life changing over the course of years. That again, it's not necessarily weeks or months, but yeah, if you can make these changes and make them stick, it's kind of incredible the benefits that accrue and they accrue up and down the whole body. I'm wondering if that's one of the uh, factors in my struggle with uh, one-legged balancing in yoga. It's really tough for me. I'm getting better and better at it. I think my ankles are probably getting stronger too and my core and all that stuff. But I definitely am not like other people that are just seem to be able to stand on one leg and not even move. And it's, and they're just comfortable like that. I'm not, I'm thinking, Oh, I'm going to go over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, first of falling over is not so bad and it's beautiful to watch someone just stick the balance. But when you waver, you're mm -hmm. using a lot of different muscles in a lot of really subtle ways. You probably balance better on one side than the other. Oh yes, definitely. And then that gets back to the psoas. But one-legged balances are also really gluteal. Uh, the deeper glutes, medius and minimus, which are really pain muscles, and they're poor posture muscles. So it all comes together when you change your posture, change your walk, your yoga starts to change. And I wanted to make a, another point about something you said that was really great about Rolfing. I worship Rolfing. I named my daughter Ida for the woman who okay. invented Rolfing. <laughs> and I really think all of these processes are just amazing, all of these bodywork processes. But what you said is exactly right, which is you go get Rolf, but you don't change the way you stand and walk, but it's not going to stick around. You know, so I love chiropractors. I really, I miss my chiropractor from New York. I haven't really found one that I love here in Cleveland. But I used to go to my chiropractor every couple of months. And what I tell people is, 
because chiropractors get getting bad rap, I think. Why, if you go in every week and they adjust just fine, but you don't do anything to keep that adjustment, why would it stick around? But if you start to change the way you stand and start to change the way you walk, you actually become a partner with the, all of these different disciplines. You partner with the chiropractor, you partner with the rolfer, you partner with your GP, you know, like doctors are great. You want to be able to help them in what they're trying to help you with and making these kind of changes really goes a long way to that. And it's really fun to see that where I'll tell people sometimes who I know get regular massages to come to work with me. I'm like, well, you can tell this person, but maybe don't and see if over the course of a couple of months, they start to see, not that you get fixed, quote unquote, but the lines of tension start to change, right? Mm -hmm. Where if you get a, a weekly massage, that person goes in and with their eyes closed, knows everywhere to go on your body. Sure. And I love the idea that changed the way you walk and stand. And all of a sudden you go into their office and they're like, wait, you're, you're a little different. Like what do you, what's going on that's making these lines of tension change. So when you're working with people, let's say, you, you know, it's, I don't know how long the sessions are. Let's just say it's an hour. And then yeah. they, they go and they're not going to see you again for X number of days or a week or whatever. Are they doing exercises that you've given them? Yes. Everyone is different. So it's very, very, individual and kind of intuitive. Like I work with a whole a big toolbox of exercises. It all starts the same way for everybody, which is standing, walking, certain exercises done differently. So I, I think most people aren't doing yoga correctly or, or exercising correctly. And I, I teach, you know, certain fundamental poses, Tadasana and like bridge pose and things that I think are, are, really important to get done and it's a really comprehensive program because i'm on about sleep sleep is one of the most important things that we need for healing but chronic pain prevents you from sleeping so that catch 22 is really difficult so i'm very particular about sleep position and everyone is working on sleep position and then the, probably the most important piece of the puzzle that's not postural or movement or exercise based is nervous system relaxation. So everyone, if you're hypermobile or a lot, another group of people, I tend to work with a highly sensitive people, people that are sensitive to emotions, sounds, surgeries, medications. You just need a certain kind of shift in the nervous system. And a lot of people, the same way people don't know they're hypermobile, don't even understand how sensitive they might be. So right from the start, we do relaxation, poses that are meant to relax your psoas and really bring some ease to the nervous system. Well, I love that. I think I'm one of those, uh, they even have a name for it, HSP, HSP. highly sensitive people. So you sound like you're hypermobile and, and HSP. You're, you're right in my wheelhouse. Yeah. I, I mean, like I, even when I was a kid, man, I'd go into stores and like the fluorescent lights would hurt me. Uh, I could hear, exactly you know, right. high pitched noises, uh, lots of noise, and and uh, visual unpleasantness. Like, really gets me. I have to leave, uh, uh, you yeah. know, places that are too crowded. Uh, I'm not afraid. It just bothers me. Even if sometimes people talk too loud unnecessarily, I'm like, ah, you're like, I feel like I'm being attacked, <laughs> even though they're they're just loud people, you know. So I probably got. I know my sister has it even more than I do. She's like, I, you know, she really can't take being in public that much she she has to adjust her mindset before she she goes so she can do it and then come home and decompress <laughs> and other people you know i always wonder like oh we're going here we're going there we're gonna go do that we're taking a vacation then we're going to disneyland then we're gonna go like really you're not wrecked by that no we love it <laughs> no everyone is different and i i wouldn't say i'm i would say i'm sensitive but not highly sensitive in the way that one of my dearest friends in the world is, is highly sensitive. And, you know, we grew up in Brooklyn in the 60s and early 70s, and no one thought about these things. And no, no. it was very clear he was a sensitive kid, but he, he wasn't getting any help. And as adults, we would be like, in, we shared an apartment, and we'd be in the apartment, and he's like, oh, my God, they're playing music so loud next door. And I'd say, they're not even playing music. And he'd say, oh, my God, it's so loud. And I would literally, like, put my ear to the wall, and I would hear a stereo if I mm -hmm. really strained. 
so what for me was a volume of one with for him was a volume of eight yeah, and that's, that's his whole life right and then so now we do live in a culture and society where a lot of people can find the resources to understand that but tons of people are growing up highly sensitive without any uh touchstone for understanding or help and and if you're in a family of like five kids and one of you are high, high sensitive and the others aren't like it's a really powerful yeah. thing to deal with. Well, you're judged too. It's just like, what's wrong with you? Just get over it. Come on. You're, you're being exactly a baby. Right. That's what basically what, how it's looked at. I remember going into a, a mall, a brand new mall. When I first moved to uh, Los Angeles so long ago, it was brand new then. Now it's closed because there's no stores anymore. It's all, everything is online. Right. But when I went in there, it was three floors open air in the center, three floors of just stores and bright lights and smells and music through cheap speakers and escalators. And, and I was with this friend of mine. He goes, Oh, you want to go to this place? And I go, all right. So we go there and I go, and I just looked at him. I go, this place is evil. (laughs) (laughs) What the fuck are you talking about, man? It's not evil. Yeah, he really attacked me like, you know, like, I mean, it was probably not the right word to use, but that's what it felt right. like to me. I felt like I was being assaulted on every sense other than taste, you know, no one was putting like terrible things in my mouth. But this human experience is so uh, unique to each person that, you know, you can't really even have a judgment on somebody because you don't know what their experience is. I mean, that is like, my life lesson I'm trying to teach my children, right? Be kind to others because you don't know what they're going through. It's not such an easy thing to do, but what I do think it's amazing in 2023, moving into 2024, just how, like I said, how many resources there now are for people. But I, I meet clients and they don't know they're hypermobile. And then at one point I'm like, well, do you realize that you're hypermobile? And it's like, this light bulb of sort of compassion can go on over their head. And if I can say, I mean, you know, you people fill out a, a intake form for me and it'll say I'm sensitive to medicines and I had a surgery that didn't work. And I can say to them, look, it's not, it's just kind of who you are, right? Some yeah. people don't medicines, you know, medicine works for the overwhelming majority of people. They're modern miracles. But if you're one of the 20%, that it doesn't serve well, it's very easy to get lost in the mix. And like you said, people think you're kind of crazy. Yeah. But for me, I'm trying to help people when I can say, look, you're sensitive. And hopefully it gives them some sense of like, oh, wow. You're like, and sometimes it's their 60, like me, you know, before they are given that insight and uh but it's a great insight to get if that's your story yeah it is and it's 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 almost like you're given permission to be kind to yourself whereas maybe before you were not so nice to yourself like oh what's wrong with me and I'm, why can't i do this and i did something recently you might be interested in this or maybe you've done it i did a full um i did a genetic profile oh interesting yeah uh, functional genetics not just my ancestors i didn't even do the ancestor part it was hmm. it wasn't even part of it And so I got the readout and there's even a little bit of an audio explanation of this gene and people does this, you have this version of this gene, which means, and it's, you know, this is the optimal version or the sort of average version or suboptimal. And because of this, and it's not just, you know, physical ailments or those kinds of uh, physical predispositions or biological, some of it was behavioral which I found really fascinating. And one of the things they said about me and this, and I always wondered about this, people with this type of, this um, type of gene marker are very good at a lot of things, but they, they don't really ever, you know, go after one thing and, and master that. And I always wondered, boy, I'm pretty good at a lot of stuff. Yeah, totally. It's great. I was never a great musician. I was never, you know, I was a good writer, but I was never like great. I was a good, you know, all the different things that I've done. And it didn't bother me that I wasn't. So I, rarely. I'm not going to say never. Once in a while, I'd go, well, I, I'm good enough. You know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty damn good at this thing that I care about. I mean, I'm not good at the stuff I don't care about, but, and I went, 
I always wonder why was that? Why didn't, and I look at this thing and it's like, how do you know me? Well, it's, it was a genetic uh, predisposition. Now, could I overcome that if I wanted to focus on one thing to become amazing? I suppose I never really wanted to though. <laughs> no, uh, first of all, I, I love that. I think that's an amazing thing. To, I think about that somewhat in terms of myself and I would never have thought it to be a genetic. Right. Thing. Blew me away. Uh, super cool. And I would think that, no, the answer would be like, no, you don't, maybe you're not supposed to like pick one thing. Maybe your genetic marker says you're meant to do many things. No. And it's in our world, that's a little frowned upon, right? It's not expected. But for me, I would, I would take that. I, I want now I want to get that genetic testing and see if I have a similar thing because I, I it's feel a, similar in my way, and I, I would take it as of like, oh, that explains it, and I'm really psyched about that. Yeah, I was I was a little nicer to myself when I found that out. Just a little right. bit. I'm a pretty nice to myself anyway, but yeah, I'll, I'll fill you in on that after. Uh, I have two things I want to ask you about. One is, is there a person you've worked with that you would consider one of the biggest changes that you've seen in, in somebody that's doing this work, like something where you go, damn, that's amazing. I love that this just happened for this person. Do you have any of those? I like, I like personal stories. You don't have to give me the name, just the address and phone number. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's an interesting question. I mean, besides yourself, because you're obviously. Besides myself. No, yeah. it's, it's extraordinary. I think like, you know, when I look at it, I think I have a really good success rate and what I'm fascinated by is everyone's insecure and I could be insecure and think I'm not helping somebody and find out months later, they were like, that was just an incredible experience for me. Like mm. it was so foundational in a lot of ways. That's how I find that kind of thing out. Like in retrospect, people will tell me oh, okay. just how meaningful it was. Like one of the things I do is I do interviews with people in the program they're up on my website, like, you know, 10 to 30 minute interviews with people who've been through working with me. They're very gratifying to my ego. I have to say it makes me feel really good because like I said, in the beginning, I'm a little bit of an intuitive and not a loose cannon. Like I'm not telling people to do things that aren't good for them, but I'm really trying to like, not to be too woo woo, but let the energy flow and come up with the solutions organically. And then to hear that they work, is really extraordinary. So when I do those interviews, I get a lot of juice about that. The interesting thing about what I do is my success stories are almost always built on the labors of the people. Mm. Like recently, I, I'm working with someone who is a referral from someone who, who is a major success story, came in with serious hip problem, numbness in the foot. And within three months, you know, some people stick around with me for a long time. Three months, this person was like, I'm done. And was so fully, like, so invested in the work. One of the things you get is you send me videos of your walk. And I mark it up like, you know, instant replay. Mm -hmm. And this person just, she didn't need to be prompted. Every few days, she videotapes herself and sent it to me. And we worked through, like, really minute details in the way she moved. And it was so successful. And again, because she did the work and then she referred someone to me and like a month in, I said to my wife, she's really frustrated with the process and I can just feel it. And it took a little while longer for her to express that frustration. And, and I'm not in the position because she's like, well, so-and-so told me like they had this incredible transformation. I can't really say, well, so-and-so worked three times as hard as you did to forget the transformation, you know, and I'm, I, there are no illusions that, you know, we're on zoom. So I'm not touching you. I'm not manipulating you. I'm just giving you guidance into what to do for yourself, but then you kind of, you have to do it. But yeah, no, I, I am uh, thrilled and amazed at the successes people have making these changes. I'll be completely honest. When I meet with people to see if I'm going to work with them, I want to know that I can help. And I can't help everybody. I don't know if you're familiar with like John Sarno and the, absolutely. You know, I read I read Mind Over Back Pain and Overcoming Back Pain. They're great books. I couldn't remember his name the other day. I was trying to tell a friend of mine who's got some sciatica stuff. 
So yeah, great books. If you haven't read them, folks, you got to read them. If you have any back issues whatsoever, my favorite part is the pain is a lot worse than what's actually going on. I thought that was a really interesting thing. And I'll tell you a story about what happened with me after I read it, but go ahead, finish what you were going to say. So I'm, I'm a big fan of that world and that's the mind body world. And there is like a huge cottage industry of John Sarno people people that have studied with him or, you know, basically doing his work, which is mind body uh, mm -hmm. connection stuff. Some people have that, you know, they're amazing. I will say in terms of resources, they're all over YouTube making videos that share with you how mind over back pain. And so I don't do that work exactly, but I, I wade in those waters. Yeah. Cool. And I meet some people and I say, look, you know, I can't tell you that you're going to get 100% better working with me, but I, you will definitely get support. And a lot of people don't get fully out of pain. They come in there. I work with some people with some really strange pain, pains that make no sense. Like where walking down the street is not possible. Mm. Like within a hundred feet, your, your back is seizing, right? Jeez. But you come to my yoga class and you can do every single thing in the class. So the same muscles that are working for you happily in yoga don't work for you when you walk. You know, many stories of similar ilk. I, I can look at that person and say, well, I can try to help you. You will definitely get benefit, but I don't know exactly why your back is seizing the way it seizes. And I don't know that we will resolve that completely. Doesn't mean there's not benefits to have, but so there are people where 20% of the world is sensitive and 80% is not, there's going to be 5% or 3% of people who are going to present things to me that I'm like, wow, I thought I saw everything. Mm -hmm. And here's another wrinkle. And, and still you can help, but it's relative. Yeah, that's a baffling case that you just said. I... Strange, strange pain. Yeah. I went to a, a psychological reason, which was the person um, doesn't feel like they deserve to go anywhere. So when they when they walk, <laughs> they seize up. But if they're if they're in one place, they're okay. <laughs> I don't I don't know. But you're but you're as right as not right, and so that's a great way to look at it. When I say I'm trying to be intuitive, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a doctor. I'm I'm kind of a nothing in that way, you know. So I'm just trying to process with people it's always about something and it's it is psychological sometimes and it can be childhood trauma and yeah. it well. can be trauma that you don't even know you had like on a purely physical level i work with people who let's say have a foot turnout or something going on and i ask for i want an injury report like i want to know your first injury and they're like i don't know i didn't have any injuries you know and then a month goes by and they're like, well, I was talking to my mother and I was in a car accident at five yeah. and they put me into a full leg cast and I have no memory of that. And I'm like, well, that's very possible that your, your body in taking on compensations for that early childhood injury, that's why you, you are where you are today. And then other people who, and sometimes it takes a couple of months to unravel it, right? Where a story of a mugging from like when they were 16 comes up, right? Where they, they really felt like they had a happy-go-lucky childhood. And then one day they get mugged on the street. And after that, everything changes, right? Where the sympathetic nervous system kind of kicks in and you live in fear yeah. and, you, you know, and, and that changes you. And, and it doesn't mean again that all of a sudden I go, oh, well, we made this awareness and that's a really great thing that doesn't mean all of a sudden you're fixed but it will give you insight into why you are the way you are which is can be really profound yeah it's amazing I mean, it's a friend of mine once said it only takes a couple of seconds to fuck up the mona lisa with a can of spray paint that so, is it. you know it's um now i'll tell you my my john sarno post reading oh great the, yeah. the book so one of the premises in there was what you were talking about was that stress can cause a lot of uh, back pain. Literally, my back used to, the phrase is not correct, but go out. It would seize up at, you know, certain spots three or four times a year. 
and I'd have to ice and lay on my back and then I'd be okay after a while. The premise of the pain being much worse than what's actually going on, that seemed very true to me when I read it because I would always get better. So it wasn't like, but I thought, well, this, this, I'm going to stress my back into going out. I must have just turned weird or whatever. So right after I read the book, a couple of weeks later, I'm involved in the strenuous activity of folding socks. And I have these socks on a bed and I, and you know, so they're not like, I don't have to stoop really or anything, just kind of lean over. And I'm thinking about, I don't remember, something, something stressful. And I pick up a sock, my back, ow, ice. And I went, oh my God, this guy just nailed it. And it was the best thing that could have happened to me because it confirmed what he was saying in his book. And I went, okay, well, now now there's a whole other thing. So between that and having a weak core, which I discovered, uh, and Pilates helped me tremendously with that, I haven't had my uh, back issue in, I can't even remember the last time. I'll probably have it now because I brought it up. But, (laughs) (laughs) but I mean, I'm, I'm talking maybe 15, 20 years now. I haven't had my back quote go out or since I've done those, since I've, you know, well, I meditate and I also try to stay out of the stress world as much as possible. And I've worked on my, my core I've done, you know, I've done, I've done a bunch of stuff. So something I thought was going to be a lifelong two or three, four times a year issue is gone. And that's just me and not even knowing anything except a couple of things. So I can only imagine going through sessions with you, how, how much improvement there would be for people that seem to have these chronic situations or, you know, intermittent chronic situations. And the truth is like in the wide variety of people I work with, there are people who do have incidences of back problems yearly and whether it's stress or not, um, you know, stress kills. That's just, it's a science fact. Stress is not good for us. So, but let's say you're someone who has a genetic problem, uh, spondylolisthesis, you know, something where your back can go out from turning incorrectly. Uh, one of the things I say to people is if you change the way you walk and stand, what normally would take you three week, three weeks to recover, you can recover in three days. Mm. Big difference. That, like, you know, what's the value in that? But more than anything, on a certain level, in the terms of the idea of be your own healer, I'm really, I'm teaching people anatomy as well. One of the reasons why I don't get injured, I get injured a lot because of my hypermobility, but no, like, knee surgery injury. But one of the reasons why when I get injured, I can heal pretty quickly is because I know what the injury is, right? I got tennis elbow about two years ago now, and took me a long time. It took me like nine months to get past it. But, you know, I did end up, I went to one physical therapist for an hour, uh, which was really helpful. But for the most part, I watched the pain happen. I self-diagnosed. I, I broke out my anatomy book to make sure I had the muscles correct and got down to healing it. And then you, so you can heal faster, which is really a benefit. And you also have just a ton of tools in the toolbox for when things do go south and then you get into stress. I don't know if you're familiar because this is an Alexander thing, but there's a pose called constructive rest position, which is um, it's an Alexander. People love it. It's my favorite pose on all of the earth. It is as simple as laying on your back with your knees bent and your feet flat to the floor, tie a belt around your leg, sit there for a half hour. Everyone I work with is doing that. Some people are doing it for hours a day. Like, you know, the people who are in a lot of pain might be doing that for a very long time. But it's one of these tools that people, every you know, across all walks of life who never thought they, it's kind of like meditating. They know that when the back's not feeling good or there's a real stressful day, you have this thing where you can just lay down for 15 minutes yeah. and all of a sudden feel a little better. Like, that's such a great tool to have. I do that. That's I, I must have learned it there. Also, the, the woman that I started with used to sort of put her hands under my sacrum and sort of pull toward my feet when my knees were in the air, mm-hmm. so it would lengthen my back. So then uh, one time I was there and I 
I put my hands under my sacrum and kind of rolled them toward my feet, rolled my hands. She goes, what did you just do? I said, well, I, I'm doing what you do, but I did it myself. She goes, I've never seen anybody do that. Ah, great. So I, I was like, oh, I'm just going to, and then I would take my shoulders and pull them to the side, you know, take the right, the left hand, and pull the right. Yeah, yeah. And so I would do that. And then the other thing I do, and I do this in my yoga class at the end when we do the uh, Shavasana, the resting pose for those who don't take yoga classes. I take uh, my towel that I towel off with in there and I fold it so, uh, and I put it under my head. Maybe it elevates my head maybe eh, at the most two inches, but it's enough to sort of align, I think, align my, take the pressure off of my head le leaning back too much and it takes pressure off the shoulder and the neck in a way that's super comfortable for me. That's what works for me. I don't know if, so I kind of invent stuff that feels right by experimentation, which it sounds like you've done a lot of that yourself. And I'm certainly no, not even close to what you've done. Well, plus I learned from my clients. You know, part of the my private program is we have group calls. And the people that take what I do really seriously, you know, I have a list of books I ask everyone. You don't have to read them all, but these are like the books that really influenced me. Mm -hmm. And then somebody starts reading that book and they start teaching me stuff because I haven't read the book in 15 years. Right. And I'm like, oh, I kind of don't remember that. Or they will take one of my exercises and take it a little further and then come back and tell me where their journey led them. And they're teaching me. And then I can use that on somebody down, down the line because everyone is different. You know, so everyone's getting different things. But uh, it's all about self-exploration. And so, you know, that's just the best thing to hear when somebody can figure out something for themselves, because you know that's getting deep weight. Like the way I say it is like, you learn from hearing, from seeing, from touch, like you learn all these different ways. And you want to figure out which way you learn best. But the best way is to actually not learn from me in the sense that my job is to be really confident, right? When I get up in front of a lecture or a, a live workshop or even a workshop on Zoom, I don't waffle, right? I say, this is what is the truth. And I, I, that wouldn't make any sense if I, and I'll say it, you know, in the course of it, I'll say, it's my job to act as if I know everything and I'm right about everything because it wouldn't make any sense for me not to do that. But that's only, that's the power of my personality. It doesn't mean I'm right. So, but if you take what I say and believe me and people do believe me, but then go explore it on your own to figure out, oh, yeah, that is right. Or that's right with a wrinkle or that's right, but not really for me. That's really when the learning happens. Yeah. Yeah. So you're an advocate for people to find it for themselves and you're a conduit and well, that's all you can do. I mean, it's wonderful. Let's uh, talk about your website, which I do want to go to and watch the videos that alone will be an amazing thing. Let's, uh, you know, how people contact you, your website, your videos, your podcast. Let's get all that information out there so the folks listening can take some of this uh, knowledge they've gotten today and take it further if they want to. Absolutely. Uh, the website is corewalking.com, C O R E, walking, W A L K I N G dot com. Okay. My program is Be Your Own Healer. My whole big thing now is called rejuvenation movement method because it used to just be the core walking program. And now there's the SOAS release party and I have a membership program with workshops in the yoga classes. So there's just a lot of things, but if you go to corewalking.com, I have a YouTube channel also under core walking. Uh, you can see a lot of my videos. I basically teach everything I teach in, on, you know, in videos, I have a blog. Anything, anything that I've spoken about here, I've written about. Mm -hmm. And if it, anything interests anybody, you just type it, the idea followed by the word core walking into Google. And if I've written about it, that comes up. And like I said, I have a podcast, A Step in the Right Direction. Oh, I love that title. Uh, just a bit of a long form. You know, as you can see, I like the sound of my own voice and it, it's, uh, I have a, a co-host and we just chat for usually about an hour and it's just a long form way of diving deep into these subjects that I love. You know, I just love talking about this stuff and um, I feel very lucky to love what I do so much. 
Well, fantastic. I really appreciate your time. I got a lot out of this one. That's for sure. It's uh, one of my favorite topics, uh, having had some back issues and, and different things. And I think most people do have posture and back and feet and neck and all this stuff. I mean, we're, we're, uh, a work in progress as a uh, totally. species, I think, uh, physically, especially. And then maybe next year you'll come up with a cure for uh, baldness and you can come back on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. No, I'm not sure about that. It's not going well for myself. So. Well, uh, you know, I'm so used to it now that uh, I, the folks that are listening can't see, but I'm completely bald. And Jonathan is uh, distinguished. Let's put it that way. <laughs> right. Well, thanks for being a guest on the show and um, stay on after we get off and I'll, I'll give you some information that you might be interested in yourself. That's so great. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been a great conversation. You too, man. Thank you. Much appreciation for you folks listening to The Exploding Human. The website is theexplodinghuman.com. The YouTube channel is The Exploding Human with Bob Nickman. Once again, I'd like to thank Jonathan Fitzgordon for being on the show. Please check out his website, corewalking.com, and have a fantastic day. Thank you.